everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Isaacson, and welcome to today's EMSA Learn webinar, where we're going to be discussing imaging organic matter mineral interactions. Um, we are so glad that you can join us today. We will um, announce the date for our next webinar soon. We don't have one uh, scheduled quite yet, but that uh, should be rectified by today. More information will be provided through our social media channels and via email for our upcoming events and our opportunities. So make sure to keep in touch with EMSL by subscribing to our email and our social media channels if you haven't already. Um, links are gonna be provided for you in the chat. Also, as of yesterday, we have exciting news. EMSL launched a podcast called Bonding Over Science. You can access the podcast through the links also that are gonna be provided for you in the chat. And now today, um, EMSL Earth Scientist, Alice Donakova will provide details on how you can leverage EMSL's transmission electron microscopy to characterize a variety of microbial mineral interactions. EMSL chemist Scott Lee will also discuss how to use EMSL's helium ion microscopy to obtain ultra high resolution images for your different materials. And Rebecca Librand, uh, EMSL user and an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, is going to walk you through how she used EMSL resources for her environmental research. There will be time at the end of today's webinar for questions. And so we encourage you to post your questions on the Zoom chat and Alice, Scott, and Rebecca will answer them during the Q&A after their presentations. And so with that, we're going to begin with Alice. Perfect. Okay, well, thanks again. So today I'll be talking about imaging soil organic matter and mineral interactions by electron microscopy. The, the illustration I have here is actually the um, mineral with organic matter on it. I'd like to uh, point out to the scale bar here. Electron microscopy is certainly not a bulk method. It is uh, taking advantage of the spatial resolution and we are talking about microns and nanometers. Hmm. I'm trying to advance. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'll be talking about how is organic matter formed and how does it look? That's why the imaging. It is responsible for aggregation, mineral aggregation, soil stabilization in the soil, uh, carbon stabilization in soils. That is very in, of, of very interest to us. And as a byproduct, it matter, uh, weathers minerals. I'll be talking about the suite of electron microscopes that we have in AMSL, but also about the STIXEM in ALS in Berkeley, which we used for chemical imaging. And what can, we, what can we achieve by imaging? We are, of course, looking at the morphology or with uh, ultrastructure on the nanometer scales. We can also do chemical analyses by elemental mapping and also by diffraction everything coupled with electron microscope. I'll tell you about our experiment. And um, also I'll make a little advertisement for our newly, EMSL newly launched initiative MONET, Molecular Observation Network. I have a hard time advancing for some reason. Thank you. Alice, you have to accept a control of the um of the slides so there should have been a button there that said do you accept control i i um, didn't see that button unfortunately okay hmm no but anyway sorry so about the so organic matter i think to these this audience i don't have to introduce how it's being introduced carbon to organic carbon to the soil through atmospheric co2 by photosynthesis it gets transformed to rhizosphere and microbes are interacting with the soils and loading organic carbon there. Also, plant litter is responsible for a big part of the components introduced to the soil. And of course, it has to be hydrated, dissolved organic carbon by the water. 
Now, uh, I get sometimes asked whether animals also uh, contribute to the soil organic matter. Of course, they do uh, with their activities above soil. And also anthropogenic activities contribute to it as well. And I still don't know. Okay, you're somebody's advancing for me. Thank you. So, what is it composed of? It's uh, it has many components. Some of them are from plants, as we said. Some of them are microbial, and some of them are just present uh, as the previous uh, 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 already uh, you know uh, present there before, and. What we are interested in is the residence time. Of course, we want to have the CO2 transform to organic carbon and be locked in the soils for a long time, not to get respired again by microbes and uh, transfer to uh, uh, atmospheric CO2. So, oh yeah, there are some processes here. Uh, those which we are interested in are uh, aggregation and mineral weathering, and everything contributes to the organic carbon stabilization. By the aggregation, we can see that the organic carbon is less accessible to the microbes to respire it and turn it to the CO2. And you already saw this table. So again, residence time is of importance here and how we stabilized or we are looking at how the organic carbon is stabilized. So now we are at the imaging. Uh, this is a typical Rache bacterium, which, uh, no, hmm, there should be one, interesting, which uh, exudes extracellular polymeric substances, which are basically uh, lipopolysaccharides and so sugars and lipids, sticky substances, which they use as adhesion to the substrates, but also the mi uh, micron sized minerals adhere to the, to the microbes. Here is uh, the image, a typical image, this is actually SEM, of how organic matter looks like. It's a amorphous kind of blobby uh, material you can see it on the mineral, which this is biotite, which was uh, in the soil for six months. And you can see that it's basically covered by the soil organic matter. This is the, on the left side, I don't know whether you can see my cursor. On the left side is the pristine mineral, which it started and within six months, it was uh, uh, covered with, um, with the soil organic matter. One of, of the principles of stabilization of organic ma so organic matter is uh, uh, the it uh, contains weak organic acids which extract cations from the the minerals, which then are incorporated into so organic matter and stabilize it. Uh, there is another example of soil uh, of mineral microbial adhesion to minerals. I think I didn't tell you I'm an environmental microbiologist. So of course, microbes are my passion here. I look at how they adhere to the minerals with EPS. Mineral weathering, we said it's a byproduct. You can see the so organic matter uh, penetrates into the cracks and expands um, those uh, features and weathers the minerals. So I'll tell you about the experiment. It was in a central Cascades in our Pacific Northwest when we um, uh, put mesh bags with three different types of minerals into the soil and incubated them uh, in, the, uh, in, in um, the soil for six months over the wet season. And then we retrieved them and analyze them. You can see here calcite, biotite, and quartz. Uh, we wanted to see the who was there, the DNA se uh, sequencing, um, what uh, was formed into those bags, 
and how was it done? That's the imaging part. There is nothing I'd rather do than to talk more about this experiment, but just very quickly, we were able to see the difference between the microbial community in bulk soil, ground, and mesh bags. A special microbial community was extracted or recruited to the minerals, uh, specifically to calcite and uh, iron-containing biotite. We did also FTICR to see uh, groups and classes of the organic carbon. And you can see here, yes, of course, there was a cellulose and tannins and lignin. And that's okay because it was actually introduced there through those pores of the mesh bag from the surrounding soil. But we were able to see the difference between the organic carbon in bulk soil and mesh bags, the newly formed organic carbon. So organic matter. So this is a little bit of an introduction of the Monet Molecular Observation Network, which was just announced last week for uh, EMSL users. And um, this is uh, automated soil samples analysis. And I wish so much this was already available at that time a year ago, exactly April 1st, when we sampled those bags, because it provides actually analyses, all of this, which we've done. So, so this is actually, if you uh, read more about the Monet on EMSL webpage, you actually are able to propose your soil uh, sampling and they will send you a luggage like that with all the equipment needed for this. Read, please read more about Monet on the EMSL website. And we are at the imaging already. So at this point, we uh, did the correlated chemical imaging. These are those two, two words. Um, um, correlated, we did all different electron microscopies, also X-ray microscopy and chemical. We just didn't take the picture, but we also analyzed what's on the uh, organic matter on the same sample. This is how it looks when we look at the soil sample. And some of you might see a microbe here. Yes. And you can see that there is a extracellular polymeric substance and minerals which are adhered to it. And we actually studied how the EPS, whether it has some signatures of the minerals which were extracted, those cations, as I was saying. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but we had our standards of what to expect there, uh, the organic carbon. Of course, this was the example of the calcium calcite. So there would be some calcium, which we'd like to see extracted and incorporated into the EPS and newly formed uh, organic matter. Then we, and we did. And... Then we brought the same sample to, or the same grid to back to EMSL and did the elemental mapping. And again, saw the signatures of those extracted cations in that. This is a high resolution image where you can see a biotite flake. This is the biotite part of this one with a thin layer, which enrobed the mineral. And we were able to see a high resolution energy dispersive spectroscopy EDS and um, yeah, we saw there actually, yes, those cations were extracted there. So briefly, ele uh, transmission electron microscopy can provide correlated chemical imaging with unprecedented insights into the interaction because the, bef between the organic matter and minerals, and it could be in a variety of environments. And I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors and all our collaborators. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Scott Lee. I am the uh, Integrated Research Platform Lead for Structural Biology. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about helium ion microscopy 
And normally this talk would be given by Shuta, but he was unable to give it today. So um, I'm here on his behalf. So um, basically, what we're trying to do is look, uh, trying to use helium mine microscopy to do some high resolution topographic imaging of surfaces. Um, and basically what we need to do here is base, is have the uh, imaging provide a lot of the details on the surface in order to understand some of the processes that are going, that are occurring on the surface. Some of the processes that are related to uh, BER include interactions between uh, microbes in uh, communities, uh, roots and soils and rhizosphere interactions, uh, organic matter mineral interactions and ice and nucleation and microbial transport in aerosols. But there's a challenge of getting this information or imaging from this information because a lot of these materials have low uh, atomic number of materials, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Um, and so it's so typically what happens now is people use SEM to, uh, to image uh, to image these materials. However, there's some issues associated with that, and that includes um, high resolution images um, are generally not possible below 10 nanometers. Uh, generally small depth of field uh, is occurring, which gives difficulty in doing three dimensional type of perspectives. Uh, there's low beam, there's a lot of beam damage materials. And also you generally need uh, coatings uh, to, to image insulating materials. Helium ion microscopy can overcome a lot of these issues, and the way it does it is basically it is similar to an SEM, but it is di is different in that it uses helium ions instead of electrons to generate the image. So why do you use ions? Well, diffraction limits the spot size of any beam, um, and uh, for ions, basically helium ions, they're about 100 times smaller than the uh, wavelengths of electrons of the same energy. Therefore, electron spot size is negligible. The way this works here is, base, is basically the tip is uh, forms the tip is a atomic level ion source, which is a trimer uh, trimer at the end of the tip, which is uh, created by field evaporation. And from this trimer, single atoms are selected as a source of the uh, helium ions. And so, basically, you have one atom as the source size. And this is just an image of the tip itself. Here is the system that we have in the building and superimposing this on there. There's the tip with the aperture in the middle. And then you have the three helium ion beams coming down on uh, from the tip. And you just rotate it so you have one helium ion coming down interacting with your sample. And it's actually a very straightforward system. Basically, you have a tip with extractor pull the helium ion uh, out. You have a deflection system to scan the beam over your sample. And it's important to note that the working distances is pretty large, and so it's really good for looking at uh, samples, rough samples, and relatively large samples. There are generally four different type of imaging modes of helium mic microscopy. Um, basically, the ion beam is coming down in purple. And the different four imaging modes are secondary electrons, which are the green uh, um, electrons that are coming off to the right. Um, and this provides a secondary electron image similar to what you would see with a, with a scanning electron microscope. Another imaging method would be uh, using the ions that are backscattered off the surface and detected on a microchannel plate. And here you're providing Z contrast, so you're actually seeing heavy elements within a uh, within an organic or light um, light matrix. If the sample's thin enough, you can have the transmitted ions go through the sample and provide crystallographic inform information. And finally, the last Im information imaging method would be um, getting secondary ions. And what the happens here is the helium ions hit a sample, sputter the surface, and you collect the mass and get some information on um, element information, isotopes, and so forth. 
So some of the strengths of healing microscopy is basically high resolution and large depth of field. If you focus up here on the top, focus on the blue in the middle, that's the uh, trajectories of electrons coming from electron beam versus over here in the right, you have red trajectories of helium ions going through your sample from a helium ion beam. There are some distinct differences. Note here that uh, the electrons coming from SEM are coming from a teardrop shape. And so the secondary electrons or the backscatter electrons coming off the surface comes from a, an area which is actually significantly larger than the beam itself. And this gives you a reason why you cannot get more than um, maybe about five to 10 nanometer spatial resolution with an SEM. Whereas a helium ion beam, um, it's really thin at where you collect the secondary electrons that come off the surface, not much bigger than the probe size. And so you actually have a much sharper um, area to collect your um, electrons. This results in uh, much sharper images, high resolution images. Uh, the other important thing is it has a well collimated beam for a large depth of field. Remember all the electrons or helium ions come from a single atom. And so in this particular case, here's an example comparing SEM to helium ion microscope, showing the differences between the two. And over on the right, the helium ion microscope uh, of the same sample uh, in the same location, you can actually see the large depth of field and the features that are imaging in the back are, are in focus and much more clear. Another example would be if you have particles on top of, on top of a substrate, over with the SEM on the left, the substrate is out of focus and the features are blurry. Over here on the right with the helium ion microscope, they're in focus and much more clear. Helium ion microscope is also good for looking at organic materials on top of uh, inorganic uh, matter. Here's an example of an SEM of carbon coated gold particles. Whereas with a helium ion microscope, what happens is you actually see the features very clearly and can see the structure of the carbon on top of the gold substrate. And this is generally washed out with SEM when you have something like a thin film on your surface. Helium ion microscope is also good for uh, non-conducting materials. Um, here, particularly what happens is the, the, the images actually form, um, the images actually appear dark because the electrons do not escape from the sample because of the charging going on. And you can compensate this by actually alternating the helium beam and the electron flood gun and that'll actually do some charge utilization. So a lot of your images can be um, imaged on samples that are not uh, coated with any type of material. And here's just an example of a 4 amnifera without the electron flood gun. Here it is with the flood gun showing all the features and you can actually zoom in and see a lot of the um, features with a lot of clarity. And again, here lastly, um, I mentioned that you do not need coating on your material with a helium ion microscope. And this is also one example of what type of things that you would normally see when you coat your sample. So all the features tend to get blurred out or they disappear um, with a coated sample. Um, helium ion microscope is also good for looking at um, beam sensitive material with an SEM, a lot of your energy is deposited at the surface where the helium ion is actually much, much deeper. And so if you have a sensitive material such as a thio on a gold substrate, what happens is with an SEM, uh, a lot of material gets uh, damaged and blurred out, but you actually see these featured really nicely with the helium ion microscope. Um, I'll just show a few examples here of what we can do with a helium ion microscope, including uh, imaging of biosamples, uh, mineral weathering studies, which I'm sure uh, Rebecca will talk about a little bit further, biomineralizations, and aerosols. Case one, uh, bone tissue engineering. Uh, we're here developing biomimetic structures that support bone mineral uptake, and the goal is to understand what occurs in early stages of mineralization. Over here on the left is, is your uh, material, your biomimetic structure without mineralization, and then you actually start the mineralization process and you can see what happens 
as material starts mineralizing and depositing on the surface. And so this gives you insight of what's going on. And while this might be something related to maybe biomedical applications, I would point out that these type of biomaterial synthesis studies are actually directly relevant to a lot of BER research programs, including the genome enabled material synthesis program. The marine bacteria Zeta proteobacter uh, produces uh, twisted appendages, which are thought to be important for its, um, eliminating uh, iron-free waste that's produced from uh, oxidation of iron two um, as part of its metabolism. And it does it by actually absorbing the uh, iron three and transporting it away from the cell. So there's some uh, study by this group called Bur uh, from Burn. Uh, trying to figure out how this occurs. Here's an example of these appendages on the surface without any coating. So this would be more representative of what you would see in the environment. And as you put the material into, incubate it into seawater and watch it for a period of one day, four days, four weeks, you can actually see these crystals grow. And these are lipido, lipidocrosite crystals that are coming on. And you actually see the structures very, very nicely. Um, on these materials. And the very last example I'll talk about is airborne soil organic matter. And uh, this particular case, these are aerosols collected from the Southern Great Plains site. Um, and these are soil organic particles that um, actually are pretty solid and do not deform on, on impact. And while SDM can give you a lot of information about what these structures uh, look like, what is missing here is a lot of the um, information about the organic coatings and films. And you see there, down here in the bottom right-hand side, there's a helium ion microscope image that um, analogous to the SEM image. And you can see very clearly that these, these halos, which are representative of organic matter around your materials. And from these images, um, it was concluded that these soil organic particles are have a liquid like coating that flow down onto the um, substrate as the materials were collected. So uh, last slide in summary, uh, helium ion microscope can provide high resolution, high depth of field, and high contrast images of uncoated biological environmental samples. But uh, the one major factor is it can generally cannot provide any chemical limit, limit information. So with that, I'll turn it over to Odetta, who I think will introduce um, our last speaker. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Scott. That was a great presentation. Uh, so good afternoon for all who don't know me. I'm Odetta Chapoku. I'm a soil scientist and team lead of biogeochemical transformation and so. And today is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker and my close collaborator, Dr. Rebecca Leibrand. For those who joined late, Dr. Leibrand is an assistant professor at UC Davis in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources. She, she is a um, soil scientist that, that is specializing in pedology and soil mineralogy. Dr. Leibrand is an EMSL user of seven years and has collaborated with EMSL Science and EMSL Scientists in her pursuit for studying mineral weathering in the critical zone, spanning from landscapes to nanoscale. I'm excited today to hear more about your past, present, and future research, Rebecca. Thank you for that, Odetta. And uh, thank you to EMSL for the opportunity to present today. I will uh, be using some examples from our team's research on how we utilize EMSL's resources, uh, specifically to uh, perform some different kinds of cross-scale soil science research. Before I uh, jump into the specifics of our uh, research activities, I just want to put a plug in for soil science and the importance of soil science and collaborative uh, teams when thinking about different types of environmental projects and activities. Uh, so soils play a role both on earth and thinking about you know, habitat and nesting, water filtration and food production. They're also very important to think about in terms of microscale uh, research, specifically on mineral weathering. And then there's also a new field um, looking at bridging soil science uh, with planetary 
uh, space science activities. So today I will be focusing on a collaborative project focused on mineral weathering and thinking about soils across different bio uh, climate uh, regimes. And before I um, specifically get into those topics, I want to first acknowledge the very large collaborative network that has made this mesh bag project possible. So we've had teams deploying these samples that I'll be talking about today in the Sonoran Desert, the coastal temperate rainforest in Southeast Alaska, Calvert Island in British Columbia, uh, Georgia and South Carolina. And all of this work would not be possible without this amazing uh, team of collaborators that you see here. And I will mention uh, more at the end of this presentation as well. So when we think about mineral weathering, uh, mineral weathering is a very important type of process to study uh, because it's how we go from having elements bound up in rock to being weathered out and being available for plant uptake um, in terrestrial ecosystems. So we are very interested in the types of mechanisms uh, that lead to these elements in the rock uh, being released to the soil and available for uptake uh, by plants, for example. And I always say this is a large puzzle and um, all of these different types of studies from micro scale to, you know, thinking about hill slope processes and upscaling processes. These are all different pieces that we need to uh, plug into this puzzle to better understand nutrient cycling processes. So with that, a lot of our work has focused on microscale processes, and the overall question driving our team's work is how do abiotic and biotic environments interact to initial, initiate mineral weathering and the formation of soil in Earth's critical zone? And this work um, stems from a cross-scale weathering project that I performed in the Catalina Critical Zone Observatory, uh, which is just outside of Tucson. These sites span from uh, the Sonoran Desert or Desert Scrub ecosystems up to a mixed conifer subhumid forest. And the overall design of this project was working across scales, uh, taking observations and properties measured in a soil profile, uh, looking at bulk soil processes related to mineral weathering and soil mineralogical composition, specifically looking at clay distribution, and then doing a microscale project where we were comparing how minerals uh, have transformed in natural systems. So we were already seeing uh, some biotite from some of our previous presenters, and we were also looking at biotite transformation across these sites, as well as dust deposition. But one of the questions that kept, kept coming up for me uh, while we were doing this work was what about the microbes? Uh, specifically, what about the fungi? How do we see differences in mineral transformation as we move across these different types of ecosystems. And so when I started to build um, my own research program, I deployed a huge number of these mesh bags, again, thanks to that big collaborative team that I mentioned at the start of the presentation. And the idea here was to put out fresh ground rock and mineral material uh, that we could study over a series of one, three, and six years to understand the incipient weathering of some of these materials across these different types of climate regimes. And so the types of mesh bags that we put out uh, were nylon mesh bags of different sizes. We've done coarse mesh at 35 microns. Uh, we had now have an intermediate mesh at one micron and then a fine mesh at a half a micron. And these bags were put out in the upper 10 centimeters of mineral soil across these different sites. And with respect to these types of materials that we selected, all of these samples went out in granitic landscapes. And so the idea here is that by putting out the salt, we were essentially putting out a form of a bait. Um, this is a fine grain material, easily uh, weatherable compared to other types of rock materials that we could have put out and its sources of calcium, phosphorus, iron, to name a few. We also deployed quartz sand and quartz sand is coarse grained. And we looked at this as almost an in-situ control. So we had an idea of what was moving into the bags and out of the bags because there wasn't actually, a, uh, we didn't expect a lot of incipient weathering of these quartz grains over such a short time frame compared to basalt or the granite. And the granite uh, materials were also coarse grain. Uh, this was basically providing a fresh supply of granite to these uh, granitic soils. And so the granite again contained uh, potassium, magnesium, iron, and calcium to name a few elements. 
And for the initial deployment, um, we put these bags out in the Sonoran Desert, Desert Scrub, and subhumid forest ecosystems in the Catalina Mountains, just outside of Tucson. And then we also deployed samples in the humid hardwood forest in South Carolina, as well as a hardwood forest plot in Georgia. Uh, since then, and I'll mention this at the end today, uh, we have also extended the reach of this project and deployed samples across Southeast Alaska in two different uh, field areas there, as well as on Calvert Island um, off the coast of British Columbia. So we've been extending the reach of these different types of samples. I'm not going to get into every specific detail of our uh, sample deployment design, but I just want to emphasize here uh, that we put out these bags in upslope and downslope positions and repeated this across multiple hill slopes within each environment. And for the results today, I'll be talking about samples that were deployed for one year in our 2019 paper, as well as three years, um, which is a big emphasis of our 2022 paper that I'll talk about. We also just received um, our six year samples. They actually survived out in the field for that long, uh, which was really exciting. So we're actually in the process of analyzing those and thinking about funding um, sources for the next steps on looking at those samples, specifically the fungal inputs. So, IMSL, um, we went and deployed these bags. They were out for these different time series. We retrieved them. And fortunately, we were able to secure an IMSL user proposal to start taking a closer look at these bags. And one of our first goals was just to understand what has grown into the bags and what is going on um, in the samples. And so it's great that Scott already set the stage for the use and the importance of helium ion microscopy. Um, these are some examples of what we saw inside some of the mesh bags with respect to uh, fungal structures. And then also um, seeing examples of biomechanical weathering uh, with this being fungi growing into and along the edges of this biotite grain that you see here. Uh, we also use scanning electron microscopy very extensively um, to look at some additional details of fungal growth. Uh, this was an example of a fungal hyphae growing uh, beneath the surface of a mineral grain that you can see documented here, and then also growing along the edges of grains. In addition to that, a later project also used transmission electron microscopy, uh, where we were actually able to select some fungal grain interfaces, like what you see growing across here. And then we were able to uh, create, uh, using the focus ion beam technique, a vertical cross section into the grain. And in terms of scale, as I go through these images, I want you to picture these being individual sand grains. So these resources allow you to subsample at the individual sand grain type of level um, using high resolution microscopy. And we've been looking at fungal growth and these types of interactions at that level of study, which to me as a soil scientist accustomed to going out and digging soil pits, uh, it's a whole new kind of world to jump into. And it's been a really exciting component of our team's research program. So this is an overview of the different types of microscopy that we've used. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about our two different papers that have resulted from this work. One of our first goals um, was to be able to capture and to identify the different types of details of the fungal growth and the different types of features that we saw within the mesh bags after deployment. And then after that, we were really interested in being able to co-locate specific fungal grain interfaces. And as Scott mentioned, uh, the SCM can give you very nice um, chemical information while the helium ion microscope can give you uh, fantastic imagery. And so we were interested in combining these two types of techniques and being able to hone this in on a very specific type of interface. And so this is an example of one of the interfaces that we looked at in this study. So again, that depth of field and that contrast that you can see using helium ion microscopy is featured here. And when we initially went through and looked at these, um, this, this particular interface using the helium ion microscope, uh, we were really interested in both the, the structure that we saw, the surrounding grains, as well as this aggregated material and the, that looked like it was adhered to the fungal structure itself. Uh, so we, um, with the help of Shuda on this project with the, with the helium ion microscope, went in and imaged several interfaces. 
And then um, students working with Odetta um, actually were able to co-locate and identify the same fungal brain interface using the scanning electron microscope. And so this is again that fungal hyphae as well as one of the grains um, that was adjacent to it. And then we were able to generate elemental maps and this uh, gave us additional chemical information. So we were able to document this as biotite, a biotite grain. This is aggregated fungal material or aggregated iron uh, material with some titanium. And this here in the red is the fungal material. So this was an example of being able to co-locate a microbe or uh, fungal grain interface. Uh, we also did a more extensive study looking at uh, fungal grain contacts um, in our 2022 paper. And during this study, uh, we were looking at different types of connections, uh, whether the fungi were growing across the surfaces of the grain or across the edges. And we were also looking at the material um, adhere to the fungal hyphae. Um, so we were looking at this as almost some early stages of mineral um, or of soil formation or soil aggregation uh, with how sticky the fungi are and even the films surrounding the different types of um, fungal contacts that we saw. We also um, went in and again looked at some of these vertical cross sections on two separate grains where we were able to identify uh, some magnetite inclusions that formed um, with, when the rock materials crystallized. And so we were able to um, look at these types of contacts in two different grains. And uh, we were able to use transmission electron microscopy to generate different types of elemental maps. And these elemental maps uh, were able to provide us insight on the different structures of the of the magnetite. So we saw evidence for dendritic magnetite as well as subhedral. Uh, magnetite. And then also this here is the fungal grain contact. So this is where the fungal hypha was growing. And this is the connection with the grain. And so this dip here in the grain uh, accompanied with that, that dark gray layer here, uh, we were looking at as some type of alteration layer um, that may have resulted from this type of contact. So we also did um, one more type of analysis that I wanted to include here. Um, which uh, was performed by Danny um, using atomic probe tomography. And this technique basically allows you to look at the uh, different connections between here's the volcanic glass matrix that we've been seeing and then the magnetite uh, grain. And so this would allow you to identify any kind of diffusion fronts um, that may be present. Now for us, when we looked at this, um, we saw what we viewed as some abiotic enrichment of calcium right at the interface between the volcanic glass matrix as well as the, uh, the magnetite. But I just wanted to include this as another demonstrative example of some of the techniques that you could use um, at IMSL. So APT also gives you, again, this interface between the volcanic glass or background matrix here and then the magnetite and then the interface between those where you can see evidence for different types of enrichment um, or just how the elemental distribution changes as you move um, from volcanic glass um, over to the magnetite. So in summary, uh, this work demonstrated how heterogeneous processes are at the micro scale, especially at this fungal grain type of interface where we observed evidence for abiotic enrichment, uh, potential and incipient stages of biotic aggregation, and then even thinking about the exposure of iron containing grains on um, or minerals on these grain surfaces could be an important a source of weathering moving forward, and then also this potential um, alteration layer and evidence for incipient weathering occurring uh, directly at these fungal grain contacts. So as I finish up, I just wanted to emphasize we have a new project going where we've deployed samples across uh, Southeast Alaska, as well as Calvert Island on British Columbia, where we're looking at mineral chips, as well as that ground rock material featured in today's presentation. And we also have multiple papers related to Erin uh, Rooney. She's a former student with my lab and a current uh, NSF postdoc uh, looking at freeze thaw cycles and permafrost aggregates. So be sure to check out Erin's papers for additional examples of IMSL resources. And then we also performed an additional study uh, looking at uh, ice, ice nucleation as a precursor for physical weathering um, using these mesh bags at IMSL. Uh, so this work has been very transformative for our team. 
And I also just wanted to quickly highlight uh, that this work was also uh, featured in a comic strip with the Critical Zone Science team, uh, where we followed the mesh bags and their deployment, and even had the um, PNNL and IMSL specifically anal um, featured here. So this is a scanning electron microscope with ODETA, and then I'm standing at the helium ion microscope. So uh, just another note to emphasize the, um, the funders and all of the team members who've made this work uh, possible, especially the Pacific Northwest National Lab team. Hopefully I didn't forget anyone in this list, uh, but overall, thank you for your time today and I welcome any questions. All right, thank you, Rebecca. That was a wonderful presentation. And thank you to both Alice and Scott as well for your great presentations. We are on our way now to the Q&A. Um, so uh, we have a few questions that um, are, you know, that we'd like to ask the presenters. And again, if you um, are inspired by any of these questions and want to submit your own, please do so in the Q&A. Um, and we will be grabbing those and, um, uh, you know, uh, getting them answered for you. So let's start off with one for Scott. Um, somebody asked, when imaging at the nanoscale or microscale, how do you scale these data up to consider how these organomineral associations impact ecosystem level processes? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, you know, basically, you're looking at things on the um, nanometer scale or up to the, the meter scale, and so what? Every time you're looking at an image with a SEM or a helion microscope, you're looking at a very narrow, uh, basically, sample or a, a, out of a big possible um, volume that you're looking at. And so uh, it is a challenge to do that, looking scaling up. Um, I guess the bulk method, the, the brute force method would be actually looking at mineral, a lot of different type of grains and so forth, and just doing some probabilities. Um, but that in itself is um, a lot of work. And so um, scaling up is actually a big challenge. And so um, I don't know if there's an easy answer for that. Um, and I don't know if Rebecca or has any ideas on what she would do to scale up, but um, I, I know it's a big challenge in our area. Got to, to build on that. Um, one of the things that we're definitely interested in, and again, it's kind of what you said in terms of brute force, it's really, uh, it's an, a complex topic to try to do that much replication, especially at the micro scale. Uh, but we're very interested in using uh, that auto identification uh, technique with the, the more recent SEM software um, at IMSL to be able to at least identify over a scale, you know, maybe hundreds of grains, what those specific minerals are, and then um, capture imagery for each of those where, again, you still have the manual component of are there fungal grain interactions going here and how do you define that? Um, but that would be one way of getting at the question of, for example, you know, are fungi selectively weathering specific minerals, uh, for instance. So I know that's something that we're interested in exploring, but you still have to have um, the engaged student or researcher to go in and identify um, what defines um, a fungal grain contact and then how those are distributed. All right. Um, so let, the next question is for Alice. Um, Alice, we know that viruses are highly abundant in soils, often in the range of 10 to the power of seven viruses per gram of soil with an average size of approximately 60, 60 nanometers, are they visible in TEM or other imaging? Do you see any in your forest soils? Yes, they are certainly, the resolution is uh, is there, of course. We see some, some viruses are as small as 20 nanometers. So yes, we do see them. Yes, they are abundant. Uh, the studies which we've done were not focused on the phages or, you know, on the viruses. However, yeah, we see them all the time. We do have some collaboration with other people 
they are interested in this one yes and we see them yeah different all different kinds of shapes yes we see them we cannot so that was a question somebody asked me Alice can you can you speciate the virus no we can't we just can image and we can say okay so this is you know this and this shape but we cannot tell this is this is to be sequenced in order to identify it so we provide only ultra structure okay wonderful um so rebecca next questions for you interesting work i'm wondering how to know the exact role of fungi in the weathering of the rocks to me fungal cells and mineral particles co-locating uh, together spatially may not necessarily indicate that fungi facilitate the weathering. Yes, that is an excellent question. And it is definitely one of the challenges of our research, um, especially if you're trying to get at any kind of indirect uh, weathering mechanisms driven by fungi. Um, for us, a lot of our work so far has focused on mechanical or biomechanical weathering, where we know that just the, the sheer mechanism of the fungi growing through the surface, surface layers of a grain or um, interacting with the edges of the grain, like I showed with that helium ion microscope image, uh, we know that that is physically uh, transforming the grain or increasing its degree of weatherability or susceptibility to being weathered after that point. So a lot of our work has focused on direct fungal grain contacts as well as thinking about things from a biomechanical side. Uh, so I definitely agree. It's hard to know, especially with indirect, indirect weathering, what could be happening. Uh, now, there are different types of techniques that IMSL has that I have not directly used myself, but I know something like MALDI, for example, may be able to help get at um, the different types of organic acids that are present in a specific sample, especially if you're using this in a mass spec imaging um, type of environment. And so that type of technology could potentially help you start getting at some of the indirect effects of weathering, or at least the presence of organic acids um, being released into a particular um, mineral weathering environment. But yes, I definitely agree. And I think that's an excellent point that you made. Wonderful. Um, so this one uh, is for Odetta. Oh, Odetta, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to answer it again, and then you can, you can ask the question. Uh, the, the work that you showed, Rebecca, uh, where we went and did the cross-section between the fungi and uh, mineral was exactly to see that evidence of the weathering. It, uh, of course, you know, there are still questions remain, but that decrease in the um, in that in the interface, the decrease in the mineral that we saw, we thought there was evidence of direct mineral weathering. So, um, yes, I just wanted to say that there are ways to address. Yeah, and Odetta, there's a question for you now. Um, so, uh, can you elaborate on the Monet proposal call mentioned in Alice's talk, and what information can be gained regarding the organic matter of submitted samples? Yeah, so the Monet call is, um, it is uh, addressed and uh, looking at the organic um, speciation and organic molecular um, characterization. And it so far we don't have it at the level of microscopy, but we are looking at the molecular uh, scale of that organic distribution and organic characterization. And, um, and uh, you could look at all the data sets that we are getting from the Monet that is provided, I think, in, in one of the uh, links that you, uh, you posted in here. But uh, um, we, we'd like to include the macro scale, micro scale characterization into the Monet. Right now, we don't have it uh, at the, for the electron microscopy. We have it at the level of um, uh, XCT, which is X-ray computed tomography, where you can look at the pore space and pore distribution and correlate that with organic matter analysis that we do on the soils uh, via extraction. All right. Um, so this next one's again for Rebecca. So Rebecca, uh, fantastic talk. I would love to know what approaches you've used to understand how these microscale processes scale up to the landscape level. 
uh, which of these approaches have been most successful and which practitioners have most successfully used this information? Definitely, yes. So upscaling, um, as we mentioned, is a very involved and kind of complex topic. Um, how we have used this previously um, was comparing what we saw at the micro scale to what we saw in bulk soil samples, for example. And so this was um, related back to the Catalina Critical Zone Observatory work that I mentioned in Arizona. So we were collecting bulk soil samples and analyzing the mineralogy of those samples. And we were um, looking at the, the uh, bedrock materials that we were able to collect. And we actually did some elemental and mineral loss uh, tau plots for these sites. And so in the bulk samples and even across these different landscape positions, we were able to say we see evidence for feldspar weathering um, through the loss of sodium as a proxy for feldspar weathering, as well as just the loss of feldspar in the soils as compared to the rock samples that we were looking at. And so we had this idea of different ways that feldspar um, is being lost or weathered away. And then at the micro scale, we were actually able to go in and, you know, with different types of replication, we looked at a bunch of feldspar grains at the micro scale, and we were able to detect elemental loss of, of sodium um, at that level. And um, the, the great thing about these critical zone sites is that there's uh, researchers uh, across all kinds of different disciplines. And so there were also scientists studying the soil water samples and stream water. And they also were able to detect differences um, based on the inputs to the, to the water and the measurements they were doing that suggested different types of mineral weathering um, that had been occurring uh, based on the weathering um, products that they um, saw in their water samples. So that's an example from how we've previously done that. And specifically, our work is focused on connecting the micro scale to kind of the soil profile or hill slope scale where you can um, get at different kinds of elemental or mineralogical loss. Um, but there are also um, teams and scientists. I, I specifically want to emphasize um, Eric Slesarev. Uh, he's a staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and he has been doing a lot of work thinking about regional or even, you know, thinking about that, you know, within the United States, um, what types of evidence do we see for additions or depletions in um, mineral or elemental materials? Um, and so I would definitely point you towards um, Eric's work. And Eric is actually partnering with um, our lab right now and uh, to try to get at um, how these react, how the reactive minerals in some of our mesh bag samples have undergone weathering out in um, different types of field sites and climatic regimes. And we're actually in the process of thinking about how to upscale some of these data that we collect in extracts from the mineral samples um, up to, you know, hill slope level or even, um, you know, more regional com comparisons across the site. So, um, we definitely don't have all the answers on that. It's a very involved uh, type of field and lots of opportunity in it. Uh, but those are some examples for how um, we've gone across different scales. Awesome. Oh, well, hey, thank you, everyone. This concludes our m to learn webinar for today. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers again for their time and um, energy into presenting on organic matter matter and mineral interactions and we hope to see you all at our next emsalorn webinar so thank you have a great day